Hey friends, welcome. This is Sean Haverson, and thank you for joining me for another episode of our Anatomy and Physiology for the Paramedic Student. Today we'll talk about the muscular system. Now, when we've talked about muscle in EMS, EMT basic and intermediate level, we generally talk about muscle and bone together. That's pretty appropriate, I think. When we talk about, say, assessing a patient that's been struck with a baseball bat, when they were struck with a baseball bat, in order to break the bone underneath, they had to go through soft tissue, skin, and muscle to do so. So very often, when we're assessing, since we don't do x-rays in the field all that much, uh, we are using kind of our knowledge of the muscular system attached to the skeletal system as one unit. Today we're going to break that up because the muscular system has a complex part of it that we're going to have to dig in and define. And that process is going to prepare us so that when we work on our cardiac lecture, uh, we have seen some of these basic concepts of mechanical muscular contraction before. So let's dive into it, shall we? We're going to start by talking about muscle in general. Uh, we'll explore a couple different types of muscle and the basic um, makeup of muscle structurally. And then we're going to start to get into our zoomed in microscopic level and see exactly how all of these individual molecules result in large tissue movement. Okay, so the function of the muscular system is primarily to uh, give us the components we need to move. By itself, muscle isn't going to get us across a room. It has to do so by connecting to the nervous system and to bone and the integument. <clears throat> it's all essentially one unit so that it can meet its goal. Now, in being able to move, that doesn't necessarily mean locomotion, like just walking across a room. It could be that we're talking about movement associated, or rather muscle work associated with very little movement. So another purpose of the uh, muscular system is to generate heat for us. Our core body temperature is uh, very sensitive to its range. And if it's out of its range and our body is cold, then we do a couple things. We constrict our blood vessels, right? They go from large to small, and that shunts blood back to our core. And then we shiver. Shivering is uh, a discoordinated, essentially, contraction of muscle fibers that doesn't result in big, gross movement, like moving your arm or taking a stride across the room. Instead, it's firing individual muscle fibers so that we can essentially create energy. And in the process of creating energy, we also create heat, which will then make its way into the bloodstream and warm our body back up. Another f function as a side note of muscle is that it's a protective layer for the structures underneath, including our bone and large blood vessels and nerves. So essentially, there's three major types of muscle. And the three types of muscle are essentially unique combinations of two major characteristics. Those characteristics are going to include striations, and control. So again, the unique connection between these will be that we'll have a characteristic for each muscle type that has either striations or no striations. And then control, we're talking about essentially voluntary versus involuntary control. Do you consciously control that muscle or is it something that happens in the background and we don't have to think about it? So let's apply that. So striations is essentially talking about the lines, the bands that we see uh, as we look in muscle. So <clears throat> let's start with uh, our figure A up here showing skeletal muscle fibers. So skeletal muscle fibers do have striations. You can see them. The little blue dots here are nuclei and we're looking at essentially a couple uh, muscle fibers. So positive striations, and it is voluntarily controlled, right? Skeletal muscle fiber is the muscle fiber that we, through our thoughts, tell our arm to say, pick up a weight so that we can do a curl, right? So that's all consciously controlled. When we look at cardiac muscle, though, let's go to uh, figure B, cardiac muscle does have striations, but 
when we're looking at control, thank goodness, it's involuntary control. We don't have to think about 24 hours a day, our heart beating, and, oh, I've got to do work now, so think about your heart beating faster. So that happens in the background. But remember, though, if we're working hard with skeletal muscle and we're working hard with cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle gets to rest. Cardiac muscle does not. And so another characteristics that another characteristic that comes in for uh, cardiac muscle tissue is the area joining our functional muscle unit together is tighter in cardiac through the use of intercalated discs. We'll explore a little bit more of that later, but it's a unique characteristic. Finally, smooth muscle fibers. In diagram C here, we see that these muscle fibers are not striated, right? So no striation. And the question would be, is it voluntary or involuntary? Well, let's think of where these things are. If we're talking about smooth muscle, we're talking about muscle that's uh, generally, in, in a lot of ways, lining cavities or spaces. So smooth muscle is lining our blood vessels, and it's responsible for vasoconstriction and relaxing, causes vasodilation. Uh, we have smooth muscle that's in the bronchi, so bronchial constriction is caused by uh, those smooth muscles contracting. And it's in our GI tract. And our bladder, it's all over the place. So when we talk about those things, those are all structures that we need to work on their own. We don't want to have to eat a sandwich and then think about it moving out of our stomach as a form of diarrhea and going into the small intestine and step by step thinking your way through getting that food through. That would be horrible. So that's a involuntary controlled mechanism. You can see some muscle types uh, ver comparing striated versus smooth in the um, Complete Anatomy app. So muscle tissue is very useful in multiple systems outside of the muscular and skeletal system. So we know that its main function is essentially to produce movement. But if we look at the tissue itself, its actual main function of those cells and tissues is to cause shortening of muscle fibers. If I have muscle fiber extending here anchored somewhere and muscle fiber extending here anchored somewhere, and this is relaxed, then if I bring these closer together, then I will cause contraction shortening of those fibers. And if that's, say, on a joint, here's my shoulder, my elbow, and the wrist, if I've got muscle connecting to the forearm and it shortens by doing this, then it will produce movement at that joint. So that's the essential uh, role of muscle. Now, what else does muscle do for us? So we've noted, obviously, movement, so locomotion. We've also talked about shivering and the benefits we have in thermal regulation. And what about circulation? Right? If we look at an artery, real thick artery, and we look at a vein, we would find that there's a pretty bulky layer of muscle around the artery. And that shouldn't surprise us because contraction or shortening of those muscle fibers causes the size of the artery to get smaller. And when they constrict, it causes blood pressure to go up. But the vein also has smooth muscle lining it, but it's much thinner a layer and not as effective as changing pressures. What veins have that arteries don't, though, are valves. So how's this tied to muscle? Well, when we're walking around and we've, we've gotten oxygen down to our pinky toe or to our foot to do its job, and now it has to carry the waist back up to the heart, it's going to have to work against gravity, and it does so with lower pressure than the artery has. It can't just cause uh, venous constriction in that to cause pressure to rise because the lining of veins is too small. So one of the things that happens is as we walk around and our, smooth, or, or rather our skeletal muscle contracts, it contracts around the veins, and when it squeezes, it causes the vein size to get smaller. That pushes fluid forward, and the valves keep it from leaking back. So in essence, the pump that we have to return venous blood, especially from our lower extremities, is the muscle contracting around the blood vessels. So another use of that shortening of muscle fibers.
I want to highlight some terms here on the next slide. You can read more about them. But these are terms that we're going to start to lay out so we can understand movement and we can understand the actual process of contraction. So we're at a macro level right now. And if we talk about muscles and the movement of the body, uh, we have to be pretty particular about what we're talking about. Now, we're not going to have to learn all of the different uh, muscles in the body. We'll learn some that are especially important for topographical anatomy. But when we're talking about muscles in the body, usually we isolate muscles and we talk about the muscles in connection to where they're connected to. And that by some part, that even gives rise to the name. So let's look at the bicep here. The bicep has a muscle body that if we were uh, lifting weights and we flex our arm, that muscle body is the the gun, right, bringing the guns to the gun show, that gets larger. That's the muscle body of the bicep. The bicep, though, is attached to bone, and it's really pretty fascinating how this works. Tendons are essentially made up of connective tissue, so they're strong. They can support uh, a lot of pressure. They, they are um, connecting directly from the periosteum, the outside of the bone, and then it's continuous as it moves on and becomes a tendon and the connective tissue surrounds the rest of the muscle. So the connective tissue that's surrounding the muscle is the fascia, okay? So tendons are connected to the outside of bone and the tendons become connected to the fascia that creates a cavity or compartment for our muscle. Now inside there, the muscle tissue is going to connect to the tendons and where this muscle, when we're talking about one specific muscle, connects to bone that isn't going to be very mobile in the action of that muscle, then we call that the origin. It comes from an area where it's not super flexible in that movement. So we're looking at the bicep. The bicep crosses over from our shoulder girdle and has tissues that are going to connect to our forearm. And in shortening, it's going to bring the angle of the elbow joint in flexion decreasing. And so in that process, the muscle inserting to another body part that does most of the movement for that muscle is the insertion. So it originates here in the shoulder. The muscle body is the bicep over the humerus, and it terminates through the tendons at its insertion point. So the insertion point is always going to be the more mobile of sides of muscle that are connected and producing movement. Very simple terms, but those terms are going to be helpful when we specifically look at a few skeletal muscles uh, and start working on our memorization. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about skeletal muscle. And this is going to be a little bit like recovering some knowledge from your EMT basic knowledge. So the prerequisite here essentially is to understand a little bit about how cardiac muscle works. And we're kind of going backwards here. But from that understanding, we can understand skeletal muscle. So muscle in general is going to have some characteristics that it shares across whichever type of muscle we're talking about. But we're most concerned with skeletal and cardiac muscle uh, characteristics. So these functional properties that we're talking about, if we were talking about cardiac muscle, would include those things like contractility, the ability to contract and shorten fibers, automaticity, cardiac tissue can start its own or create its own uh, electrical impulse causing depolarization can be a pacemaker cell. So those are the characteristics we're talking about. Now the characteristics in skeletal muscle are a little different because it isn't involuntarily controlled. So let's look at a few of them. So contractility. Starting with contractility is probably pretty important because that's the role of muscle when we're talking about movement. So contractility is the ability of the uh, muscle fiber to shorten, shorten when stimulated. The next is elasticity. Elasticity is the characteristic or the property that muscle has in which it can be stretched 
and then return to its original position with little to no damage. Think about a lot of the tissue in our body. Is it, is it elastic? Is it designed to stretch without breaking? Some stuff will stretch, but it breaks in the process. So the elasticity that we have in muscle allows us to kind of work similar to a rubber band. Excitability. Excitability is the property in which the muscle can be excited by depolarization nearby. It receives a stimulus and then it will do something with it. So excitability is obviously part of our cardiac muscle function as well. Extensibility. Extensibility is a little different than elasticity. So when we're talking about elasticity earlier, we we're talking about being able to stretch and return back to your position. Well, extensibility is just the property, essentially, of being able to stretch or extend without breaking. Just like the stretch Armstrong, when we pull on the limbs, they are certainly going to extend or get farther apart from each other. And in doing so, they create greater distance. So extensibility is an important role for skeletal muscle. Now let's talk about the microscopic view. We've been spending quite a bit of time on macroscopic stuff. Let's get down to how this stuff actually works at the subcellular level. So what we're looking at on this screen, let's kind of point out and orient ourselves. Uh, we're essentially looking at the bicep. We've got some muscle fiber that is uh, extending off of the humerus. So we can see the tendon. The tendon becomes a sheath around the muscle body that's called the fascia. And the muscle itself is essentially complex, more complex layers as we get further and further away from the center or myofibril. So when we start zooming in on the muscle body, the next structural unit is going to be the fascicle. The fascicle is a bundle of these uh, muscle fibers together and has a collection of blood vessels, including veins and arteries, capillaries, and nerves that eventually will communicate with individual muscle fibers. When we look at the, fasc uh, the uh, fascicle and we start zooming in, eventually we come to the level of muscle fiber. So the uh, fascicle is a collection of muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are collections of myofibrils. And myofibrils are the essentially subcellular structure that creates uh, our movement and our, bone, our muscle structure. Now, if we look at um, our figure B here, this is actually just a drawing that's representing the lining of these myofibrils and how they coordinate with each other to produce movement. So let's orient ourselves. We're going to hear this term, the sarcomere, we're going to hear this term pretty often and derivatives of it. So sarcomere is essentially the functional unit of muscle. This is the thing that creates movement. So one sarcomere is going to have a collection of myofibrils that basically match up to each other. And when they bind and connect to each other, they shorten by bringing one muscle fiber closer to the other. Now, when we're looking at our sarcomere, it's essentially going to be bedded off by these Z lines. Z lines are a physical uh, distinct separation between our sarcomeres. And when we're looking at our sarcomeres, we can use terms thick and thin filaments. We're going to give more terms for that in a moment. But this drawing is basically representing what we see in C. In figure C, we see a contracted muscle. We have our Z line and the sarcomere we can see has different linings. If we zoom in here, we'll be able to see different uh, thicknesses of lines. But basically, these are the muscle fibrils, the myofibrils connecting together to produce movement. You can see some of this on the Complete Anatomy app under Skeletal Muscle Fibers. Okay, so now we understand the overall structure, I think, of muscle, especially skeletal muscle. So we've gotten a lot of the anatomy out of the way, the gross anatomy anyways. We're going to zoom in and look at our cellular anatomy for the muscle cell and how it functions um, soon. But before we do that, let's add a couple more terms to just finish off what our skeletal muscle specialization is. So when we're talking about movement, as we highlighted earlier in the diagram with our origin insertion of muscle body, when we're talking about muscles and movement, it kind of depends which specific movement of that muscle 
are we talking about? So when we're talking about movement at a joint, so maybe bringing the forearm closer to the humerus, movement at a joint has a couple specific terms. If we've got, let's say that we're looking at the elbow joint here, so the elbow's right here. In this state, the elbow, let's say, is at rest. And so we could measure this angle right here, and that would essentially be the angle of this joint. And that's important because when we're talking about movement at a joint, the rule is decreasing the angle, right, making the angle smaller, is flexion. Now, let's say that we did lift up the weight, and we've, at the elbow, raised our forearm. The angle here has shortened, so this is flexion. The opposite, though, when we extend, let's say that we're done, and we're now putting the weight down on the rack, and our elbow is here. We just increased the angle of that joint. And so in doing so, the opposite of flexion is extension. So the angle of the joint will be relative, uh, relevant to understanding which structures are working when. So if we're talking about a bicep flex, bringing the forearm closer to uh, the humerus, we're talking about essentially movement primarily of the uh, bicep brachii. When we start looking, though, at all the muscles in an extremity, they don't all sit dormant while one works. So as we're talking about movement around the origin and insertion point, we can also talk about the muscles engaged in changing the angle at a joint. The prime mover is going to be the muscle that does most of the work of whatever movement we're talking about. And that changes. So as an example, if we had our elbow joint here, and we were looking at bringing the forearm closer in both of these cases, when we do so, the movement primarily is going to be the bicep, right? That's for flexion. But if we extend we go from flexion to extend, the bicep is no longer the prime mover. The tricep is. So even at one joint, the movements opposite each other are using different muscles in different ways. So we're going to talk about essentially the movement of flexion of the upper arm as our uh, example. So in that, the prime mover is going to be uh, the bicep. Now, synergist and antagonist. The antagonist, we just kind of got out of the way. The antagonist is the muscle that's going to do the exact opposite movement of the prime mover. So for a bicep, that would be the tricep. Synergists are, are other muscles that are involved in the movement, but they don't do the bulk load of muscle movement. They fine-tune. So this is where some of our fine motor skills come into play. If I'm picking up a weight from the weight rack at the gym and I'm lifting it to do a flex with my uh, arm, then when I lifted it and started flexing, the overall movement is just bringing that uh, bar, that dumbbell closer to my arm. But what's really happening, though, is we're trying to stabilize the wrist movement, trying to stabilize the shoulder movement. All that's important, and they're not carrying the overall heavy load of movement. But without them fine-tuning, we're going to have really spastic-looking uh, movement. So as we look at some examples... We can look at still the motion of the upper extremity, and we've got this diagram here that highlights the prime mover, biceps brachii, triceps are our antagonist when we're flexing the elbow or decreasing, right, decreasing the angle. When we go the opposite route, the bicep becomes the antagonist and the tricep becomes the prime mover. And in that case, we're increasing, we're increasing the angle at that joint. Synergists are help stabilize. So in this picture, they're showing a gentleman who, or, or a young lady who's got water, and they're about to drink it. So if they just had their prime mover working, they would probably lift this can or, or cup of fluid up too fast and strike themselves in the face with it. So the synergists are going to help with the common movement uh, that they're responsible for. Generally, when the prime mover crosses two or more joints, synergists are going to help try to stabilize movement in those joints so that only one joint is moving at a time, if that's our focus.
posture is a little different than the normal muscular, muscular contraction that we're exploring today. When we're talking about posture, it's not resulting in a whole lot of movement, right? So let's imagine what you're going to be doing in the ambulance. Certainly, we want you to sit in and, and strap down so that you can ride in the ambulance safely. However, they haven't really solved the problem of us needing to get around our patient to do work, especially critical work. So at some point, you'll be standing up in the back of the ambulance, perhaps with an IV bag in one arm, in one hand, and um, an IV solution uh, line in the other end. Or we've got a medication vial in one hand and a syringe in the other. So we're trying to stand without holding on to anything and get our upper extremities to coordinate in a highly complex maneuver while we're going down the road 70, 80 miles an hour. So in that process, without us really even thinking about it, thankfully, our muscles inside the body, especially around the spine and our extremities, are helping to stabilize the movement. If the vehicle is turning one direction, our body is probably going to help stabilize the opposite direction so that we don't topple over, for example. So the specific type of muscle contraction that occurs in this case is tonic contraction. And so that's going to have a bunch of muscle fibers uh, that are coordinated, but only a few of them are going to shorten at one time instead of all of them producing gross movement. You can see examples of these types of contractions in the Complete Anatomy app. So those tonic contractions help keep our tone, tonic tone, help keep muscle tone so that we reduce the strain or the fatigue that's going to be experienced by the extremities. If you're standing for an hour, you're standing for two hours, your body is going to be fatigued and holding up your posture just in standing, not even moving. Because when we're doing this, the muscle fibers that we're using, since not all of them are being activated at the same time, we might produce fatigue in only certain muscle fibers. So let's talk about fatigue. Fatigue is essentially when a muscle fiber of any kind, doesn't necessarily have to be involved in posture or uh, tone, uh, when a muscle fiber of any time is essentially depleted of its energy source, then we start to develop fatigue in our muscles. Uh, since we're talking about skeletal muscle, um, really what that ends up doing is the energy production is ineffective at that point, perhaps because of anaerobic respiration, in which we create a little bit of ATP, our energy source, and we produce a lot of acid and CO2. Now that acid is going to build up in our, our uh, blood tissue, on our muscular tissue, and won't immediately be cleared. So lactic acid amongst muscle tissue is going to be perceived as stiffness and pain. And we'll talk about why stiffness at the end of this, when you're fully relaxed and you've worked out, why still stiff? So when we get depleted of the energy, we reduce the amount of work that we can do, and we also at the same time create some toxic chemicals that may impact the protein fibers of muscle. What really happens, though, is if we're an average person in average health, and we're standing uh, on the sidelines, and we're getting a physical or we're, we're working with a personal trainer. If we're standing there and we haven't done a whole lot of work, then we probably have enough oxygen in our bloodstream and oxygen stored in myoglobin inside my skeletal muscle so that when I do the work I'm going to have to do, I can do some of it immediately without having to rely on energy taking in the same amount of at the same time. So for example, if you jump onto a treadmill and you set the treadmill to a fast pace and you start running, you don't immediately start getting out of breath. Even if you don't run very often, the first few steps that you take, you're working on oxygen that's already in your body. And so we end up having an oxygen surplus. You can even call it a savings, in which when we're at rest, we're not using all the oxygen to create ATP, to create the energy we need to do work. Instead, we're breathing at the same rate. We're just holding on to the excess oxygen that we have. Part of it is going to go into our hemoglobin in the bloodstream, and some is going to go to hemoglobin's cousin, myoglobin. Myoglobin holds, ox holds on to oxygen specifically within the muscle itself so that it has an oxygen reserve. So that all builds up our O2 surplus. At some point, though, if we continue to work out with a lot of strain, with a lot of uh, exercise, 
and exertion, we will eventually run out of the extra oxygen we have and we'll go to an oxygen debt. And when we're in an oxygen debt, we really, at that point, go into anaerobic respiration and we produce only a small amount of ATP and a whole bunch of acid and CO2. So fatigue is essentially the stage in which we've run out of energy and we're probably converting into other forms uh, to get the energy we need to do work. Okay, now let's zoom in very heavily and we're going to start to look at how muscle fibers actually contract, where the energy comes from, uh, and to later apply that to cardiology. So let's get a couple things out of the way uh, first. So when we talk about skeletal muscle in this case and its communication with the nervous system, we use the term innervate. Innervate sometimes is used for all sorts of stuff, including innervation not just of nerve cells but of blood vessels into tissue. What happens here for our innervation is our motor neuron, its axon, is going to be dispersed across skeletal muscle, and it will have multiple axon terminals coming from that one axon source that will or should all depolarize at the same time and send a neurotransmitter across to the receiving cell at the same time. Well, this is important because these individual axon terminals are communicating with individual muscle fibers, and all of them essentially need to contract at the same time to produce movement. So instead of having the complexity of multiple neurons communicating with each of these muscle fibers and then communicating with them with themselves our body's design is that we have one axon that can communicate with multiple muscle fibers at once so the point that we end up connecting the axon and terminal to the muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction in this picture, uh, we can see in diagram A, the neuromuscular junction is highlighted by essentially looking at a slide where we have skeletal muscle surrounding in red, and then we have this black fiber going down with multiple branches all the way through. The fiber that I just drew on with orange is the muscle, is the nervous system fiber, which is actually the axon with multiple terminals. In this picture, uh, in diagram or drawing B, we can see basically that's reproduced. Now, this is showing that it, we have a myelinated uh, axon with Schwann cells, and at the terminal portion of the axon, it has multiple axon terminals communicating with all of these muscle fibers. It's really amazing how this can happen, but it's essentially necessary at the very least. Quick question for you, though. When we're talking about depolarization... What type of uh, depolarization or nervous cell conduction occurs when we have myelinated sheaths? Do you remember? These are the nodes of Ranvier, and they say in some layman's terms that the impulse jumps from node to node. But we know that's not true. It's amplified on the inside in saltatory conduction. You probably didn't think you were going to hear that word again. All right, let's keep going. So how the muscle fiber actually contracts. A couple things to highlight. We've got some terms. So the muscle structural unit, the part of the muscle that does all the work, is called the sarcomere. Now, the sarcomere is, is a term, the sarco portion, is a term that we're going to see used in a few different uh, cellular structures. So we have sarcoplasm which basically is the same word for uh, the cytoplasm. We have a structure, very interesting structure, called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And when we talk about reticulum, think about the endoplasmic reticulum that we talk about in normal uh, human cells. It's a storage and processing site where we have things like proteins attaching to uh, other proteins or creating large complex structures. Well, the reticulum part of this means that it's holding on to something. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is essential in muscular contraction. Also, the sarcolemma, 
It's got one L in it, so excuse my writing. The sarcolemma is going to be the plasma membrane surrounding the muscle cell. All right, so we got the sarco stuff out of the way. Let's get a couple more terms. So we've talked about the Z-lines, and the Z-lines are the bands that create the barrier separating one sarcomere from another sarcomere. And that's an, actually an important physical structure that we'll see in a diagram in a moment. What we're going to talk about is the Sliden filament model, and that basically outlines how skeletal muscle and likewise uh, cardiac muscle contracts by having these uh, individual fibrils slide across each other. And when you read about the process, they say that the sliding across each other is essentially like similar to a caterpillar crawling up a twig. Now, this is going to require some additional molecules. We've already talked about sodium and potassium's role in depolarization of cells. That was for our neuron. Now we're going to have to add calcium, ATP, and a few other structures. So let's get familiar with them. Okay, so when we're looking at microscopic structure, a sarco, a sarcomere is made up of individual fibers or fibrils. And these fibers are protein fibers that have very high degrees of being wound together and formed. The thick myofilament, and then literally when you look at a slide, it appears thick, is myosin. The thin filament thinner than myosin is actin. So actin plus myosin is essentially the components that make for our sliding uh, filament theory. Okay, we're zooming in. Now we're looking at that motor unit. Let's zoom into that. Now we've zoomed into the level of an individual muscle fiber. So remember, all these muscle fibers, this is one muscle fiber, all these muscle fibers would then come together to create fascicles. And when we're looking at a muscle fiber, it's made up of myofibrils. Remember, our myofibrils are thick and thin. Anytime we've got an opportunity to practice these, let's do that. Thick is myosin. Thin is actin. Great. Now, what we're looking at here is the entire muscle fiber with some dissection. So this is the muscle fiber out here as it would appear on the outside. So we can see the sarcolemma, which is essentially the plasma membrane for this muscle cell. We have mitochondrion, so we can create energy, see how it's strategically located in between the fibers so that the blood supply nearby and the cell can receive as much energy as it can put out. Now, once we remove the sarcolemma, we kind of uncover this wrapping that's occurring. So we've zoomed in here. And in this kind of zoomed in area, we can see one sarcomere right here. There's another sarcomere right here on another fiber. And the sarcomere where the Z-bands are located are physically separated by an extension of the sarcolemma called T or transverse tubules. The T tubules are basically the plasma membrane extending. So if we looked at this in a different view, we could see the depression in our sarcolemma. Here's our T tubule. And if we looked at it across, then we would see that the T tubule is essentially an inward projection of the sarcolemma. So it has very similar um, structure as the outside of a cell uh, membrane. So the T-tubules extend so that they go inside and communicate with the individual myofibrils, and they're connected to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is extremely important in cardiac uh, and skeletal muscle, and another degree in smooth muscle. And what it does, especially in skeletal and cardiac muscle, is the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a calcium storage location. Remember, calcium as an ion has two positive charges associated with it, and as such, it's double the amount of charge that sodium or potassium have. So we have internal storage of calcium all around, and these little extensions are basically extending so that um, our nutrients and our calcium, when it's time, can extend across the entire fiber and activate it. So let's keep zooming in. Now we've zoomed into the microscopic level inside the cell and zoomed in even further until we look at individual protein structures. Okay, so remember, these are individual protein structures. We can see our Z line. The top picture is basically showing our relaxed state 
and the bottom is showing our contracted state. So what's a few other things we have to add to this picture. Uh, first, let's highlight the Z lines are basically the band, the band, the barrier separating the uh, sarcomere from the next sarcomere. The Z lines are going to have a physical attachment to our actin or thin filaments. The thick filaments are sitting in between, and notice that our thin filaments don't extend all the way across. So our thick filament, the myosin, has multiple myosin heads on it, and it's three-dimensional structure, so they're twisted around the length of this um, helix-style uh, fiber. And so those individual heads are going to attach to binding sites that fit that structure within actin. And when it's contracting, these heads will reach on and grab here, and pull, reach on and grab the next one, and pull, and pull, and pull eventually until this entire line has shortened. So the cross bridges are essentially the connections between all of these structures. And in contracting, the cross bridge is the structural unit holding everything together. All right. Okay, before we look at the exchange of ions at the uh, cellular and subcellular level, let's just highlight some of the structures that we're going to talk about. Um, you do need to know these definitions and their major role in the contraction of muscle, and this will be almost immediately applicable to cardiac muscle and cardiac pharmacology. All right, so let's start off with stuff we know, sodium and potassium. Sodium is a one positive charge cation, and it exists outside of the cell. It's in the interstitial or third space, making it the abundant extracellular cation. Potassium okay, with one positive charge, exists inside the cell. It's an intracellular cation, and in that state, it's the most abundant in initial depolarization. So we've seen how these change across their membranes and cause a polarity that's reversed and depolarized to produce an electrical impulse in a neuron. Now, we hadn't talked about it yet, but neurons do also use calcium. So calcium here is a cation. It's primarily going to be an intracellular cation for muscle cells, but it is also within our interstitial space. And remember that calcium has two positive charges compared to the one positive charge of sodium potassium. We'll also talk a little bit about magnesium. Magnesium is actually a little bit more important for our smooth muscle uh, cycle, but magnesium is a smooth muscle relaxant. It has a positive charge of two, just like calcium does. Another term that's going to be a little bit new to us is nicotinic cholinergic receptor sites. Nicotinic cholinergic receptor sites are basically describing the receptors on the muscle that receives the neurotransmitter sent across from the axon. So we can get right off the bat, it has the term cholinergic in it and not adrenergic. So in that sense, it's going to be acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter. The nicotinic sets it apart from other types of receptor sites like muscarinic, who may also be using similar neurotransmitters. So this is important partly because we need to tell the whole story of a neuron communicating with muscle, but also because when we're working with patients, we may have to deal with or turn off or activate. We may have to manipulate the connection between nervous tissue and muscle tissue, specifically when we have to do something like paralyze a patient during rapid sequence induction. A couple more terms here. These are larger structures for the most part, and almost all of them are protein structures. So Titan is going to be our largest, it's a giant protein, and it essentially is connecting to our uh, actin and myosin structure and working as a big screen spring. We're not going to see any pictures of it, so imagine that it's on the end of the sarcomeres uh, helping to serve as some elasticity. Troponin we'll talk about. You may have heard of troponin, troponin before. Uh, if you've heard of troponin before, it was probably associated with an MI in our line of work, uh, somebody assessing troponin levels to see if a patient is having a heart attack. Well, troponin is in all sorts of muscle, so we're going to just kind of detach it from the cardiac piece for now. Uh, troponin is essentially a three protein complex that's going to be blocking a binding site. So it's almost going to require a key to remove it so that actin and myosin can bind together. Troponin and tropomyosin are closely related. 
Tropomyosin is a two-strand helical structure of protein that's attached to troponin. And troponin is strategically attached at the sites where actin and myosin will bind. Actin is our thin filament. Myosin, our thick filament. Another thing about myosin, myosin can be in a low and a high energy state as we're uh, going through the power stroke of contraction. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then our myoglobin, hemoglobin for muscle, which is responsible for the color of meat. If you go to a store and you buy a steak that's pretty fresh, it will be bright pink red. And as you cook it, it turns from red to brown to maybe even gray if you overdid it. Well, the color change is associated with physical changes of myoglobin. When it is oxygen rich and bound to the iron structure in myoglobin, it appears pink. But as we apply heat and cook, say, a steak, uh, we're separating those structures and we physically have changed the chemicals to an ionic form in which now we've lost the red color and we get brown. Okay, so now we're going to get into the, the fine details of energy production in skeletal muscle. Again, will be applicable to cardiac muscle. Okay, so we're going to talk about how we get energy to do the work. Then we're going to follow almost as if it's happening, as if somebody is contracting muscle. We're going to follow the depolarization of a neuron leading to the depolarization of a muscle cell, and ultimately contraction. So the contraction part has to have some form of energy to do its work. So our energetic compound is generally ATP, adenosine triphosphate, in which we have adenosine connected to three phosphate ions. ADP is adenosine diphosphate, in which we have only two, and that other, that third phosphate ion is detached, and we could certainly also have AMP. Now, the, the process of creating ATP does involve, as you've learned before, uh, does involve the use of oxygen, glucose, and is performed in the mitochondria. But there are multiple ways, actually, to create uh, an energetic form of ATP. And that'll be very important for our process of muscle contraction and relaxation. So there, the three major ways are going to be through aerobic respiration. This is also going to be the slowest, but it produces the most and longest lasting type of energy. Now, another form of uh, creating energy, ATP, is anaerobic respiration. And that's kind of intermediate. Um, unfortunately, when you create energy without oxygen, you get very small amounts of ATP. So this is going to be a much decreased output of energy. And then finally, and the third way that we'll talk about is direct phosphorylation. Now, direct phosphorylation is actually going to be the quickest way of creating ATP. So what's occurring in um, energy production, and the use of CK will come up in just a moment, what's occurring in our energy production is we're using components. Let's start first with aerobic respiration. We're using components like oxygen and glucose, though we can find other sources of uh, the the sugar source or carbohydrate source, we can find other sources to help us create energy if that's not bioavailable. But oxygen really needs to be there. Through this, it'll go through what I call the, the biblical loaf of bread. This is the mitochondria and all its drawings. It looks just like this. Inside the mitochondria, the structures and atoms are under going to go... Blah, blah, blah. Inside the mitochondria, the structures are going to undergo a process that will eventually result in about 32 ATP molecules, so 32 adenosine triphosphate. And as a byproduct, it creates a little bit of CO2 and a little bit of water. So this is aerobic respiration. Now, let's say, though, now we've got our structure. We don't have oxygen. There's no O2 available. But we do have glucose or some other form uh, of, of uh, energy component. If we go through this process, we can create ATP, but we get more like 2 ATP. And as a byproduct, we get large amounts of CO2 
and we also get something that wasn't produced in aerobic respiration, we can end up with pyruvic and lactic acid. So an anaerobic creation of energy is going to be somewhat limiting because remember, not only does it not produce a lot of ATP, but CO2 and lactic acid are eventually going to build up in the muscle, and that's the cause of fatigue. If the lactic acid spreads throughout that muscle, it may produce pain as it comes into contact with sensory nerves. But the lactic acid is going to impact the protein structures and local pH as well. So we're hoping for aerobic respiration. We can go through anaerobic respiration. And then let's talk about that third one, our direct phosphorylation. So in direct phosphorylation, we're using a couple uh, chemicals that maybe we haven't seen before. So on the left side, CR is our abbreviation for creatine. That's the molecule st molecular structure. And on the right side, PCR is phosphocreatine. Now, the conversion of creatine to phosphocreatine is facilitated by a functional enzyme, and we know it's an enzyme because it ends in ACE, called creatine kinase, often abbreviated as CK, and may have things like MB or CKBB following it in lab values. Remember that when we're looking at uh, some of these structures, creatine kinase is a good example, we find it in different tissues. So to narrow down exactly where it was released from, uh, we have different types of tests. We'll get into that on a later date. So Using creatine kinase and utilizing ATP, we can convert these molecules actually back and forth. So on this diagram, we're showing that we can turn PCR into CR. We can also turn CR into PCR. And it's that back and forth that then makes our phosphocreatine an energy reservoir. What do I mean by that? Well, if we have phosphocreatine, we can convert it to creatine, and in doing so, we should release ATP in the process. Well, how's that work? Well, remember that ATP is essentially adenosine with three phosphate ions attached to it. And when we go from ATP, the high energy form, to something like ADP, we have adenosine with two phosphate ions meaning it lost one. It's the loss of that one phosphate ion that generally changes the structure of often a functional protein and allows it to do work with that energy. For example, if the phosphate ion is essential in changing the shape of the sodium potassium pump so that we can get these ions against the normal gradient and establish the action potential. So, you could probably guess that when we say phosphocreatine, we're basically saying that it's creatine with a phosphate ion. So we can see that structurally. When you look at creatine on the left, there are no P's. When you look at it on the right, we can see the phosphate ion here. So how does this happen? Well, let's go back a little bit too and talk about a process learned in our chemical block called hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is usually a component in which chemical reactions are working with the subcomponents of water, and so lysing or breaking up water. If we separate water into its components, we have a hydrogen ion by itself and a hydroxide ion uh, on its side. We have the hydroxide ion uh, by its side, and in doing so, we generally will either create or use energy in the process. So with hydrolysis, we're able to convert these structures back and forth. If we have lots of phosphocreatine, we can convert it and get ATP out of it. So the single phosphate ion then is attached to adenosine diphosphate to make adenosine triphosphate. Once though the, the uh, phosphate ion is released from phosphocreatine, then it will go back to its creatine structure. Now it needs to have an enzyme to facilitate this process because it's a pretty complex reaction. When hydrolysis is part of this equation of converting an adenosine triphosphate structure into adenosine diphosphate with one phosphate ion to do the work, that essentially is going to break apart and release energy.
that energy that's released is essential. That's the thing that does work. So we'll find that adenosine triphosphate converting to adenosine diphosphate with a phosphate ion separated is extremely important. We can make more ATP by using things like anaerobic or aerobic respiration, but in a pinch we can use the structure of phosphocreatine to extract a phosphate ion using creatine kinase and add that phosphate ion from adenosine diphosphate to create adenosine triphosphate. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a, a drawing representing our motor unit. So on the left side, we have our uh, neuron communicating across to the motor neuron uh, junction, the neuromuscular junction, and across from our neuron is our motor end plate. And the motor end plate is where the receptor sites are going to be for the neurotransmitter. The entire structure of both of these cells is the synapse, and the space between them is called the synaptic cleft. Now, also in this picture, we show the muscular membrane and its T-tubule. Get our T-tubule there. It's T-tubule extending into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, we'll zoom in further and look at the muscle cell's myofibril contraction in a moment, but that's occurring in the same cell that we're talking about. So let's go through these steps. Recall that when we looked at the depolarization of a axon and we had an uh, electrode re reading electrical impulses inside the axon, we ended up with a particular waveform. And if we had zero here, that waveform went up and then it quickly went back down. The up spike is the influx of sodium and going back down is the repolarization of the cell. So keep that in mind. We're going to draw that as we go to the muscle cell and change it slightly, and that will be the basis of our cardiac uh, pharmacology. Exciting, right? So let's get started. Okay, so at the point of us having an action potential, we have sodium on the outside of the cell creating a more positive environment than the inside of the cell. That was facilitated essentially by channels opening and closing. Once all the channels are closed, we can then work across the natural gradient. So we can pump stuff into the place it shouldn't be by using the sodium-potassium pump, which we have highlighted here. Sodium-potassium pump is going to use ATP. uses ATP, donates a phosphate ion, and then that will cause the pump to pump at a ratio of, we get three sodium out for two potassium in. And so both of these are positive charges of one, but because we have three on one side and two on the other, that gives us a difference of basically one charge. So that's where we get the idea that the inside of the axon is more negative than the outside because there's more sodium on the outside and less potassium on the inside. Okay, so that depolarization sends. We send a signal and we say, I want to curl this uh, uh, dumbbell um, and flex this bicep. That's our goal. So the signal goes from our voluntary control centers in our brain, traveling through motor neurons or efferent pathways. It makes its way eventually to the axon that's going to communicate with the muscle cell. So let's say that this axon is communicating with the rest of this muscle cell, and we're looking at just one thing happening. But remember, because of the neuromuscular junctions, multiple axon terminals, this all happens at the same time. All right, so as things change, we have opening of our fast sodium channels. So sodium rushes into the cell and that makes the inside of the cell more positive than it was. So the relationship now, the relationship now is that the inside of the cell will be more positive than the outside. As this happens, it triggers other sodium channels to open because they've met their threshold and more sodium happens to go into the cell as it propagates all the way down. Now, let's say we've gone through all of the uh, axon and we're now at the terminal. Now, these little greenish uh, points are, these green blue points here are calcium channels. Now, this is kind of new to our discussion. We didn't talk a whole lot about this previously, but in this particular case, calcium is going to run rush into the cell as the sodium channels cause depolarization. The voltage-gated calcium that rushes into the cell then attaches uh, 
to these hundreds of vesicles that are created in the axon terminal, and in this case, they're holding onto the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So calcium induces that process. Acetylcholine uh, vesicles are going to travel to the end of the axon terminal. And uh, as they do, they're going to fuse. Their pl the vesicle plasma membrane is going to fuse directly. Fuses directly with the outer portion of the axon at the plasma membrane and releases acetylcholine. Acetylcholine will be released into the synaptic cleft and eventually make its way over to the motor end plate. So at the motor end plate, we have receptors that will bind. Remember, these are nicotinic cholinergic receptors, and they're going to bind to acetylcholine. And when acetylcholine binds to these receptors, it changes the shape of a fast sodium ion channel that's immediately next to it. So again, outside the muscle cell, we had sodium at a higher concentration than we had the potassium inside the cell making the outside of the cell more positive than the inside of the cell. So just like we had in the neuron depolarizing. What happens as our acetylcholine attaches to the receptor, it opens the fast voltage-gated sodium ion channels, and sodium rushes in. That causes depolarization. So the inside of the cell along the plasma membrane, as sodium rushes in, rushes in, and triggers more sodium to come in, eventually that's going to amplify, and it will reach through the T-tubule. Remember that T-tubule is that inward projection of the sarcolemma. The uh, action potential and depolarization will amplify down the T-tubule. Event It will next cause calcium channels to open inside the sarcolemma. As the calcium channels open, calcium rushes in from the interstitial space and will eventually make its way to receptor sites on the endoplasmic reticulum. Once calcium attaches to the endoplasmic reticulum in what we call calcium-induced calcium release. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is storing calcium, and calcium is essential to allow muscle contraction. So the, the calcium that rushes into the cell after sodium has triggered the calcium channels to open, the calcium rushing into the cell will then open up the channels of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which releases even more calcium into the cell. Eventually, that calcium is going to go do its work on the microfibrils. Now remember, if we had our graph representation our x-axis is going to be uh, time in milliseconds, and our y-axis is going to be millivolts, and we're measuring below and above zero. So if we had an electrode going inside the nervous system cell, let's do our axon depolarizing in green, it starts off at an action potential, right? So it's below zero, sodium's on the outside of the cell, potassium's on the inside of the cell. Sodium channels open, and sodium rushes into the cell in high amounts. Both sodium gets through the cell in the channels, and sodium permeability in the cell increases. And then after the sodium rushes in, potassium is going to rush out, and we're going to try to restore the balance. So eventually, we have to go back down to our action potential. And once we've done so, we've created our depolarization cycle. We went from a very negative position to a very positive position, and that caused the upward swing in this measurement. Now, what ends up happening in a muscle cell is similar, but produces, because of the addition of calcium, a different waveform. So let's do our muscle cell in purple. Let's say they start at the same point, action potential. Fast sodium channels open, sodium rushes in. So we've got our upward stroke. We're now more positive uh, on the inside of the cell than outside. Sodium permeability is, is increasing, and so as sodium rushes in through the channels that have opened, um, that triggers further channels to open along the length of muscle, just like in the neuron. Well, then we get this downward little stroke, and we end up with a plateau in a positive charge. Now, the plateau is essentially where calcium has been released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. I'm exaggerating a little bit with the length of the plateau. And then we'll start to repolarize and bring it back down.
So that waveform in purple is essentially the same waveform that we're going to study for the cardiac muscle contraction. Now, a word of caution, though. We're only measuring electricity here. Right? So we could have a beautiful waveform here and no mechanical contraction, meaning the muscle didn't contract, it didn't shorten, the heart didn't beat, whatever it was. And that's the, a really important point in distinction to say that the electrical system of our cells is not exactly tied directly to the mechanical system, not in a way where if electricity is going through and we can measure it and it looks beautiful, then we must have a contraction. No, we hope so. But the mechanical section is separate from the electric section. And what happens in the electric section does not always result in mechanical going through. So that'll be very important when we learn our cardiac section and are working to manage cardiac patients with our ALS monitor and defibrillator. So if we break these down into steps, we could kind of say that step zero, step zero is sodium channels opening. Then we get to step one or phase one. Sodium channels close. Okay, so it kind of stops the leaking a bit. Phase two. Phase two is up here at this plateau. Calcium channels open. And usually this would be contraction. We'll see that step next. Three. Calcium channels close. Potassium channels open. This is three. And we begin repolarization. And then finally, four is we are at our repolarization state. We fully repolarize and we're at the action potential. And then the next depolarization will be phase zero. So keep these handy. I'm going to give you another diagram when we do the cardiac block that will help you. And we'll cover each of these stages in cardiac block as well. But if you can understand why this waveform has its presentation, then you're on the way to understanding how an EKG will work. Now we've zoomed in. And let's say that we just went through that process of depolarization. The uh, calcium was released into the sarcoplasm or or cytoplasm of the muscle cell, and it's eventually going to make its way to actin and myosin. Okay, so actin and myosin. Remember, actin is the thin filament. Myosin is the thick filament. And the way that these are structured, the actin and myosin are anchored, and one sarcomere ends with our Z lines. Remember, we've got also titan connecting that giant protein connecting these together, and myoglobin is circulating oxygen for the production of energy, okay? So what ends up happening in the uh, movement or contraction of muscle is after the acetylcholine is bound and we've rushed the sodium in, we've rushed the calcium in, the calcium now is going to make its way, remember, all the way through that sarcoplasmic reticulum. That surrounds the sarcomere. So we're able to release calcium at the myofibrils. So what's happening for this to occur is we find that myosin and actin are in a state in which if they were allowed, like this picture, to connect, they would prefer connecting. And when they connect, actin and myosin slide across each other and that shortens the fiber. But in reality, what we find is we have additional structures that are preventing and regulating that connection. So remember, myosin and actin really love each other. They want to be connected. And if they're free to make that decision, they will connect together permanently. But in order for this to be a process, a cycle, a phase, we have troponin and tropomyosin added to the mix. Remember that troponin is going to be a three-protein structure. And we basically have troponin in those kind of that three structure. Troponin can be in a few different forms. Some of it is relevant to cardiac. But those three protein structures are physically preventing myosin from attack, attaching to its binding sites in actin or its active sites in actin. Troponin is situated right over the binding site and it's held in place by tropomyosin, which again is a helical protein strand. So what ends up happening here is we're in the relaxed state now, 
calcium was released, calcium is going to travel attached to the, tro uh, to the troponin, and that will facilitate a movement where troponin tropomyosin will move out of the way of the binding site. So we can see that calcium was attached to the troponin, and we've got actin and myosin ready to bind. So it's a little more complex than then just connecting together. What happened in the last cycle of contraction and relaxation before this was ATP attached itself, ATP attached itself to the myosin head, and in doing so, it separated from one of its phosphate ions. So now we have ADP and a phosphate ion right next to it. Okay, so we're going to zoom in now and see what happens as these two separate. So troponin and tropomyosin have moved out of the way because calcium is bound to troponin. So what I didn't share with you is before this cycle, the last time the muscle was contracted and relaxed, what had to happen for this is ATP, so we're going to put it with our three phosphate ions, ATP had to attach to the myosin head. And when it attached to the myosin head, it changed its shape. The shape is essentially considered energized at that point. So we had ATP. As the head moves into the space, ATP becomes ADP, and a phosphate ion is separated. Now, in this process, the high energy state is essentially the state that's going to allow this to work. With, with the shape change, right, so we could say maybe the conformational change is like this, a little bit steeper angle, whatever it is, what's happening is these filaments are going to bind together, and then as it's binding together, the myosin walks along these sites. And so they say that it's essentially like a centipede walking across these myofilaments, where it will grab here, push that way, and will move on, grab here, and push that way as it goes down the muscle, the actin thin filament fiber. Okay, so we just did work. Yay, we contracted. All right, so we shortened our muscle fiber. Now, how does it get back to its normal state? Okay, now these are bound and they've done their contraction. So realize that this is the state that the cell, the fibrils love to be in. So it took energy for our conformation change. So remember we had, we had ATP that was connected and converted losing one of its phosphate ions becoming ADP. Right, So in that, it's in its high energy state and its physical structure changed to meet this. If we don't have ATP present, if ATP is not being produced, then we can't actually change the structure of myosin and allow it to detach. And so without ATP, the natural state of low energy, because it lost its phosphate ion, is attached to actin and myosin. And that gives rise to muscle stiffness when someone stops creating ATP, for instance, when they die. So if they're not creating ATP, we end up with, <clears throat> over a period of time, the ATP that's residual in the body getting used up. It's no longer in a, low ener uh, a high energy state, rather. It's in a low energy state connected between actin and myosin. So it's essentially stiff and contracted. And that will lead to the phenomenon rigor mortis. Now let's say we need to get back out of that. We've done our contraction, we've slid along the fiber, now we're going back to our relaxed state. In the process of relaxation, a few things are happening in the background. One, calcium is getting pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right, to prepare for the next phase. Now, in this process of relaxation, ATP, because we lost the last one, ATP now, created by our anaerobic, aerobic, or uh, respiration using direct phosphorylation, ATP now is going to attach to the myosin head. When it attaches to the myosin head, it changes the shape of the myosin head, changes the shape of myosin's head, and prepares it to detach. So in this process, what happened in reality is ATP attached to the myosin head, and through hydrolysis was separated from its phosphate ion. 
And in that process, it changes the myosin head so that it can be ready in a high energy state for the next contraction. Magnesium's role in the process is essentially to be a smooth muscle relaxant. There's a little different process that occurs in the contraction of smooth muscle and re uh, relaxation of smooth muscle, but in short, magnesium helps facilitate the process of ATP, changing the, my the myosin energetic state and allowing the smooth muscle to relax. A common area for paramedic students to make some mistakes is just in comparing and contrasting the terms isotonic versus isometric. So isotonic and isometric are basically theories associated with how muscles contract. When a person has an isotonic contraction, they're going to increase muscle tone and produce movement at a joint. So if you go to the desk and pick up your iPad, you've experienced isotonic contractions in the muscles that surround uh, your upper extremity. So the change in length of the contraction here results in movement, but that's not the only type of movement that's present. It's a contrast to isotonic is isometric contractions. Isometric contractions don't produce movement. So, for example, an isometric contraction would be if you walk over to a wall and you put all your energy into physically pushing against that wall and the wall doesn't budge, you did shorten muscle fibers. You did increase the contractile state of muscle, but there wasn't any movement because the object you're pushing against isn't going to move. Okay, well, that wraps up the majority of our discussion on muscles, especially the muscular system's microscopic view and function. The remainder of this chapter, you'll want to focus on the diseases that are present in muscular systems as outlined, differentiate between sprains and strains, and identify from the list in the PowerPoints the muscles that are outlined. Those muscles will be useful in topographical anatomy. We use that to aid our assessment, to orient ourselves, to figure out what's underneath of the skin since we don't have x-ray, and we use it to adequately describe to other providers and to the patient where we're finding assessment findings. If you have any questions, reach out to me. Have a good one.